this is going to be short and sweet, okay? <laughs> I have to stand close to you because you got the robot that on. That works, that works. I'm a little chilly this morning. Yeah. This is Derek Broman. He's a biologist from TPWD, and he represents the Fort Worth section, but you, your office in Cedar Hills, right? Mm-hmm. That's correct. And Derek has been doing some great research on bobcats, and I feel fortunate that we got him today. So um, thank you very much for coming, and you bet. I'm just going to turn the show over to you. That'll work. Anything I left out, fill it in, okay? <laughs> you bet. <clears throat> Please welcome Derek Brown. All righty. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, thank you, Van, for the introduction. Again, yes, my name is Derek Broman. I am the urban wildlife biologist for Tarrant Denton Counties here in the Metroplex. So technically, I am a biologist for Denton County. Um, this is my first interaction, really, with the chapter. So I first off want to thank everybody for your involvement with the Master Naturalist Program. Uh, you have, hopefully, you have an inkling of an idea of how incredibly valuable you are to Texas Parks and Wildlife and Natural Resource Conservation in the state of Texas. Um, very simply, weird. there's absolutely no way that Parks and Wildlife and other uh, natural resource organizations can get anywhere near their long-term goals without your help. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much for being involved in this program. And if I can ever help you out with anything, please give me a holler. Uh, a lot of times people don't even quite understand what an urban wildlife biologist does. Uh, we won't get into that today, but if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them here at the end. So, uh, yes, today I'm going to be talking about um, bobcats in the Metroplex and some of the research that we have going on here. And uh, I've got a pretty meaty presentation, um, so if you have a dying question, go ahead and raise your hand. Chances are I might be getting the answer to that question before it's all said and done. So ideally we can get to the end here and have a good Q&A session. We can even veer off beyond bobcats. Probably chupacabra will inevitably pop up as well. <laughs> um, so we'll try to keep it light and, and moving on here. So I'm um, real looking forward to chatting with you folks here today. So... Um, Real quick idea of what I'm going to be talking about here. I'm going to talk about distribution of bobcats, their behavior and ecology, identifying their tracks and sign, um, what we know or what we think we know about urban bobcats and kind of urban carnivores in general, and then also give you an update on our cooperative urban bobcat study here. So uh, bobcats are the most wide-ranging field in all of North America. They're darn near found just about everywhere. Um, and as a matter of fact, this little gap right here in the Corn Belt region, that's shrinking pretty rapidly. Uh, I think it was 47 of the lower 48 states saw a uh, population that was stable or increasing. The one state that did not see an increase was Delaware, just because they don't have any numbers. Little anybody state. Um, in Texas, however, bobcats are located pretty much statewide. Um, they are a uh, non-game species, they're an unprotected species in Texas, just very similar to a coyote. So there is no closed season. However, if you do harvest a bobcat and you wish to sell that pelt and it goes outside the state, you do have to get what we call a CITES tag. And I did, brought a, did bring a, a pelt in here today. You can see that the tag on that, that fur is a CITES tag. Um, so pretty much everywhere. No big surprise that they're all throughout Texas. Um, Uh-oh, our screen's kind of messing up. But... Um, Bobcats are sexually dimorphic, meaning that males and females are different sizes. Uh, here in Texas, uh, most of our males are probably going to be on average in the low 20s, whereas our females are probably going to be in the mid-teens. Um, these animals are dead. They are not lying there very, uh, you know, they're not that talented. Um, oh, wow, color ratio. Uh, it's supposed to be coloration, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, they range a little bit of everything. Um, you can have everything from stripes to spots to rosettes. You see kind of the rosette look on that cat. Um, they range in color from a red to a gray to a charcoal to almost a black color. Uh, and this, the coloration ranges all throughout North America. Um, down here, we've got kind of a lot of cats that kind of look kind of bland, kind of dirty. If you're familiar with uh, the fur industry, they've got specific names to that. Um, but when it comes down to it, um, for the fur industry, they're very focused on the belly spots because it's that white background with the black spots that go into a lot of cuffs and uh, edges on a lot of coats. <clears throat> Bummer. Uh, so, 
Uh, some of the distinguishing characteristics of bobcats, if you didn't know it, they got their name from their bobtail, not because some guy named Robert first discovered them. <laughs> a lot of times, though, people are quite surprised at how long that tail is and, and how much it can move. A lot of times people think of a short tail and they think of their crop tail on their dog. And all it can do is just basically kind of, you know, nub it around. Um, bobcats actually have a tail long enough that they do flick it, they roll it as they're moving along. So when people see a bobcat for the first time, they're like, well, I think it's a bobcat, but it had a longer tail than it should have. No, that's just the length of a bobcat tail. Most people aren't very familiar with it. Like cats, they do have retractable claws. They have a white patch on the back of their ear. And they also have ear tufts and face rough. You can see this cat, he's not too happy, so he's got his face rough out. Just like your, your house cat or your dog, when they get excited, they puff up, look big, mean, and aggressive. Um, so those are definitely some characteristics, especially if you see something dead on the side of the road. If you're kind of curious about a bobcat, um, a lot of times, even if you don't see the face, if you can see that white patch in the back of the ears, that's a first indication, but also raccoons have that as well, so that's not exactly a dead giveaway. Yeah. Now, here's a fun question. This isn't really the case here, but just up the road in Colorado, you've got, what's the other uh, lynx species here in North America? The Canadian lynx, yes. They have a short bobtail, too. And how do you tell the difference between a, a lynx and a bobcat? The ears, maybe. I don't know, if, if you go on the internet, you look at photos of both, they say ears, big feet, right, so they can walk in the snow better, longer legs, they're supposed to be larger. If you actually look up the, the size and the characteristics of bobcats and lynx, they're almost identical. They're actually usually the same weight. Lynx just have longer legs. So a lot of times it's very, very difficult to tell the difference between the two. But the one thing that you can use to tell the difference is that bobcats have white on the bottom of the tip of the tail, whereas lynx, their tip of the tail is black all the way around. So that's the only thing you're going to be able to tell the difference between those two critters. Not really an issue in Texas, <laughs> unless you're at the zoo. Um, but that's one thing that's important when you're in those areas where you actually do have both of those critters exist. Um, so their behavior, they are solitary, meaning they like to be by themselves, but they're also territorial, where they um, don't like to have much overlap with the same sex. So females don't like females, males don't like other males. However, one male will try to overlap with as many females as possible. They're crepuscular. What's crepuscular mean? Dawn and dusk. Dawn and dusk. So all too often, there are a lot of species that are crepuscular, but we just assume that they're nocturnal because we see them when we're going to bed and we see them when we're waking up and we just automatically assume they've been active all night. That's not the case. Bobcats are just that case. You think about it, a lot of what they're going to be eating, and we're going to get to that in here in a little bit, that's when their prey are most active. It's dawn and dusk. Um, and they're ambush predators. Yes, they will go up in a tree, but usually that's to flee something. Uh, they don't do quite well in trees. They don't hunt in trees. They really operate by pouncing, by surprising something and chasing it down. Um, oh, goodness. So uh, there have been a number of studies done in Texas on rural bobcats, and the information that they saw there was that males had a home range of about two square miles, whereas females had a home range of about one square mile. And like I said before, males will try to overlap with as many females as possible. Uh, also, what we oftentimes observe is that males will sometimes be willing to overlap a little bit with other males, whereas females most often almost have no overlap whatsoever with one another. Um, Partially that's because of the energy requirements needed to raise young. It also could be that when a male has much larger home range, it's harder for him really to dictate, define, and defend the edges of his home range. Um, and so we talked about uh, reproductive output and needs. Uh, females obviously have the young, and they have uh, about two to three litter, or, um, two to three kittens per litter. They'll usually only breed once a year. Um, breeding will occur late winter, so kittens uh, will pop out about 60 days after. Um, and only the females care for the young. So the male and female will get together, uh, and then once that's done, the male pretty much leaves, and it's all the female's responsibility for rearing these young. Um, the kittens will stay with the mother for about six months to almost a year. It's really hard to say. There's been a lot of work to try to look at when exactly it is that mom kicks them out of the basement, um, but nothing really shows up. They can depart as early as uh, late summer, or they might stay with mom until the next year's breeding season. But then at that point, again, as they're solitary and territorial, 
those animals have to leave and find their own new territory, their own new area that isn't already occupied. Um, bobcats can live to be over 10 years in the wild. Uh, a lot of times the major factors at hand in survival are um, road mortalities throughout much of the state. Uh, depending on where you're at, however, you can have an increased number of uh, animals being harvested. Um, but uh, it's a tough life out there. Most animals barely live past five or six, and this is a, a photo of an individual that he was five years old when he was captured. You can see that he's missing the canine up here. This one's busted off. He's supposed to have six upper incisors. He's down to three. You can see the high gum recession. His gums, when he was younger, were about right there, and they moved all the way up. That guy's only five. So uh, oftentimes it's very difficult to tell the age of an animal just by looking at some of those features. You can obviously rule out kitten or juvenile, but you wouldn't know if that animal was five or ten years old. So diet. Uh, I told you that they are ambush predators. And the one nice thing about bobcats and a lot of our cats are that they are very, very strict carnivores, meaning they will only eat meat. Uh, quite often, they will almost always eat live meat as well. So they have a mouth basically full of little razors, little knives. They're not the best chewers. If you ever look at your cat, who has domestic cats? How many of them eat dry food? How many of them look terrible when they're trying to eat dry food? All of them, right? It's because they're trying to crunch on something and they can... Yep. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, they're trying to crush something, but they have a bunch of knives. It doesn't work well. So that can be troublesome for them, but for scientists, and I'll try not to get too gross here, um, it's great for trying to identify what these animals are eating because when we do a stomach content analysis, we're pulling out whole rabbit heads. We're pulling out squirrel legs. We're pulling out big chunks of animals because they chew them up just enough to swallow them. So it's pretty easy. It's not really much of a guessing game when you're pulling out a mouse that just has a bunch of holes in it like mouse. All right, done. Keep on moving. <clears throat> Versus something like a coyote that has the teeth for the grinding, they're going to mash things up really, really, really well. And so those critters, we have a tougher time also because they can eat everything out there. They can eat fruit. They can eat trash. They can eat dead things. And they can crush through bone. Bob can't, can't do that. So some of the... Uh, Studies in Texas that have looked at bobcat diet, no big surprise, the largest uh, number of, of critters that show up in their stomachs and in their scats are your small rodents, are your small rabbits, are the things that are highly abundant, nice, soft, and squishy, really don't have a defense besides being able to be quick and agile. But bobcats are quick and agile as well. Um, uh, occasionally, bobcats will try and you know find whatever else they can eat. We're finding out that they're spending a lot of time near wetlands. In urban areas, uh, we get lots of reports of them preying on domestic ducks. Can't blame them. They're dumb. Um, <clears throat> and throughout the range of North America, we've been seeing an increase in the bobcat population for about the last 30, 40 years. Um, a lot of that's been due to the Endangered Species Act and some of the CITES work. Um, but we've also seen a decline in some of our prey, po or sorry, our game populations. And naturally, people just assume one's correlated to the other. As master naturalists, most of you understand that pretty much everything is habitat-based. So quail populations, wild turkey populations in North America, um, a lot of those critters pheasant, which aren't native. But we're seeing declines in those populations that's habitat-based, not the product of a few more predators on the landscape. Um, <clears throat> So again, going after the squishy things, the things that are highly abundant, can't, can't fight back. Uh, many times I've heard stories of, especially bow hunters, you know, they are out there um, elevated, they're silent, they're camouflaged. They've seen so many times where they'll watch a bobcat catch a squirrel or a chipmunk or something little, play with it a little bit, let it go. Just to catch it again, play with it a little bit, let it go. They are just supreme hunters. Um, I'm really, really impressed at cats, and unfortunately that's why our domestic and outdoor domestic and feral cats are such a problem, is they kill for fun. Um, whereas bobcats, they're killing, but they're toning their skills while they're still killing for need. <clears throat> so obviously in a, in a metropolitan area, and even in the rural areas, the, some of the questions that first come up are, okay, what are these things? Are they, are they a pest? Are they a nuisance? Um, Texas, in, sorry, bobcats in the state of Texas are non-game species. A lot of times, historically, they've just been lumped in that category of vermin. You know, shoot on sight, can't have them, don't want them, good riddance. 
Um, and a lot of that was because the concern for pets and livestock. Um, but uh, with their diet being small rodents, small mammals, it's pretty easy for them to find the meal that they're looking for. Uh, if we don't give them an opportunity to prey on some dumb, fat chicken that's wandering around in our yard that's been bred for thousands of years to be dumb and fat, you know, if we don't give them an opportunity to do that, there's certainly no issue there. And so in the, the Metroplex and elsewhere, um, sometimes poultry farmers can have a little bit of conflict with bobcats, but po poultry farming has been going on for thousands of years. There's nothing new behind it. If you have a secure chicken coop, you're not going to have an issue. Um, and even with pets, smart pet ownership and pet ownership practices can alleviate almost all issues with wildlife. If you've got some teacup fuzzy thing, <laughs> don't let it outside at night unsupervised, right? That's just common sense. So if you're really concerned about your pets, well, don't let that dumb little fluffy thing outside unattended. <laughs> If you've got the 60-pound lab, it's probably going to do just fine because these bobcats, which we'll get into their size just here in a little bit, aren't very big, about maybe 15, 20 pounds, foot and a half tall, eat rabbits and mice and squirrels and rats that barely weigh a pound or two. So if chances are your pet has already exceeded that limit and it's too much work for them. Yes, ma'am. Her question is, do they eat domestic cats? It is. It does happen. It is rare. I haven't heard it very often, um, but I've heard far more accounts of pets dogs or cats, acknowledging bobcats as they walk through the property. They kind of look at each other and go, you know what, you're not worth a fight. Both of them thinking that. A lot of times the public doesn't understand that, that these critters are on a minute-by-minute -minute basis trying to survive and make it to the next day and the next day and the next day. They don't go looking for a fight if that fight could lead to them dying. Very simply, if it doesn't, it's not necessary for your survival, why exude that energy? Why take that risk of being injured and potentially die? So bobcats, carnivores aren't pick and fight with our pets if, they're, if they don't benefit. Especially a lot of our pets are eating 14 square meals a day. <laughs> they're in really great shape. A bobcat might not do that well in a fight with a lot of our pets. So a lot of times we don't, we don't think about how these critters are oriented, how they're geared, and we don't give them enough credit. Another issue people have with bobcats and any carnivore in general is disease. Um, this map's a little difficult to see, but when it comes to um, rabies, um, really, in the state of Texas, our issue with mammals are bats, raccoons, and skunks. Bobcats, I think, yeah, they're not even on this map for 2013. I don't think there's even been any 2014, so it's very rare. Again, with anything, when you have disease, um, it's more likely to spread when you've got animals that are in, in tight groups, in large colonies. You know, if they're shoulder to shoulder with thousands of other buddies, you're going to have a higher chance for disease transmission. When you've got bobcats that are solitary and territorial, it's much more difficult for things to spread amongst animals like that. And also the question is, okay, how do they do with the other critters? How do they do with the other carnivores in an area? Um, through some of our research, we've got a lot of great trail camera photos of bobcats interacting with coyotes, bobcats interacting with raccoons. Again, they both understand it's not worth it. Um, there's been a lot of great research that have looked at bobcats, coyotes, and looked at how they interacted. A lot of times it was resource partitioning. One would go here, one would go here, and they'd live their lives just fine. Um, we know coyotes are pretty brave. We see them everywhere. They stand on the side of the road and just watch cars go by. Um, bobcats are a little bit more secretive. They go into the nasty, thick stuff. A lot of times, because they are a cat, they can move so much better than a dog. They can excel in a lot of our wetlands, a lot of our riparian areas, a lot of our early successional habitats that coyotes really are not that great at. So they, that's kind of how they divvy up their space, and they do just fine without having to have much conflict between each other. And then humans. Um, you know, people are always concerned. Well, I should watch out for my child. Well, again, if your child's this big, it probably shouldn't be in the yard unsupervised, <laughs> especially at night. So there's some very simple things that, you know, people want to blame these critters. Like, well, okay, are you being a responsible pet owner, you know, livestock owner, parent? Uh, geez, I hope you're not letting your toddler just, you know, okay, it's 2 a.m., let's go ahead and let him go do his business in the backyard, and then we'll let him come in in a bit. <laughs> um, so these animals, again, they're a foot and a half tall. All of us here are far more tall, far taller than a foot and a half and far larger than two pounds. So again, these critters, they don't really know who we are, and so they're, they're always having to size up the situation to understand, okay, is it 
worth the effort to try to have an encounter, to interact, to attack, to fight? What is it? What is the, my best option? And oftentimes it's to leave. Um, so to, again, when people see wildlife, they're like, it didn't immediately run off. It just looked at me. It's sizing you up. It's figuring out, do I need to run off? You know, if it can just saunter off, walk off, that's even still better than running off because they're not wasting as much energy. So again, a lot of the public never thinks of things through the eyes of the wild critter. They just immediately think, worst case scenario. Um, so for bobcat tracks, um, they're pretty much as wide as they are tall, uh, about two inches by two inches. And oftentimes, if you're going to run into tracks outdoors, and especially in these areas, um, if you're going to be running into a, a sizable track, the thing that you're going to want to first do, in my opinion, is to rule out coyote. Um, simply because they're just as abundant as bobcats, if not more. Similar size track. And really, the, some of the major differences is that a coyote track is longer than it is wide. Um, if you look at the pad, the bobcat pad kind of has an M shape. It's got two lobes at top, three lobes up at the bottom. Whereas the coyote track looks like an upside down V. Um, another trick that I call the rule of X, you can draw a line between the toes and the pad of a dog, but you can't do that with a bobcat track. You can't do it with your house cat track as well. So seeing that X sometimes can be kind of difficult to try to even, you know, even trying to make out the pad can be kind of tricky. But one thing that oftentimes pops up, whether it's sand, mud, snow, what is that? Um, is this space between the toes. So if you're walking along and you see some tracks, you can't quite make out maybe the claw marks to, to, you know, to, to recognize that it's a dog, obviously no claw marks for the bobcat, but you will see this star staring up at you. That star oftentimes is that dead giveaway, that again, you're looking at a coyote, you're looking at a domestic dog. Bobcats don't really have a star, maybe it looks like some sort of castle or crown or something, but you know, that's one dead giveaway too, because even in the worst substrate, that star is going to be popping up at you. In scat, um, this is fun too. Great that it's not like lunchtime right yet. <coughs> um, bobcat scat and coyote scat, again, kind of similar in size, maybe about as thick oftentimes as a, an adult finger. Um, bobcat scat is blunt-ended. It's often segmented. Um, this is the appropriate time of year to be saying this. You know when it comes to Halloween uh, and you get those little Tootsie Rolls that are about yay big and they come in like those little segments, you know? That's exactly what reminds me of Bobcat Scat. So have fun with that in a couple weeks here. Um, so Coyote Scat is also tapered at the end and oftentimes will be twisted. So if you've got, you know, sizable scats, look at them, see are they twisted, are they segmented. Um, a lot of times bobcats will also have a scrape in the area, and I can show you what a photo looks like that. But I guess I should ask the, the audience here, how do you first recognize or identify the difference between a wild animal scat and a domestic animal scat? Fur. Seeds. Fur. Fur seeds, bones. You know, Fido down the street is not eating a whole bunch of bunnies all the time. Hopefully not. Um, <laughs> And so you're not going to have a high abundance of fur and bones in the scat. And again, if it's a bobcat too, you, you might see a jawbone. You might see a claw in that scat just because bobcats, again, don't grind it up very well. Um, so near that site where you're going to be finding that scat, a lot of times you'll see a scrape where the bobcat will either mark its territory or right after it's eaten, um, it'll scrape up some of the ground, maybe pedal a little bit. Uh, you can see this here in the, the, the uh, grass or in the leaves, um, and also their gait. Their gait is really obvious. So if, a lot of times if you're trying to figure out what critter made tracks, and let's say it's a bad substrate, you can't really make out the tracks that well, well just the location of the tracks gives you an indication of what that animal is, how it moves, think about also where it occurred. Um, when you see a cat move, it's very deliberate, very specific, very smooth. They put their back legs in the holes of where their front legs went, so oftentimes, if you see bobcat tracks, it looks almost like the animal is walking on two feet. It's also almost in a perfect line as well. So you'll see almost a perfect line of tracks walking straight away. And a lot of times, it's very deliberate. You'll see a nice flow to the pattern. Whereas you think about your dogs, they're idiots. Their legs are flailing all over the place. <laughs> they are not very pretty. They're not graceful at all. As much as you think your you know, Great Dane is graceful, they're not. Um, so you're going to see their tracks kind of go all over the place. You're going to see a wider gate. You're going to see a larger space between the tracks. Um, also, oftentimes, they're going to be kind of dragging their feet, kicking their feet. Cats, it's foot up, 
foot down, foot up, foot down. Dogs, it's just kick stuff all over the place. So should you have leaves? Should you have sand? Dare I say, should, should you have snow? You're probably not going to see much between the tracks if it's a cat. Or if it's a dog, you're just going to see stuff kicked all over the place between them. Um, and this slide says uh, urban bobcats. <laughs> the limited research suggests um, that uh, animals or bobcats have, um, could have higher population densities just because um, they may have smaller home ranges. There's really been one to three urban bobcat studies conducted in all of North America. And as we all know, urban is a very, very uh, relative term. You know, Denton, you can say Denton's rural. Yeah, but it's not downtown Dallas, right? Um, so some of these urban studies have been taking place in national forests next to Los Angeles. Yeah, that's not really, you know, concrete and 80% impervious surface. But some could also just the same that the Metroplex really isn't that urban because we're pretty green. We've got a lot of green space. We've got a lot of rivers. We've got a lot of uh, water that's creating a lot of great habitats in riparian areas. Um, some of the research also suggests that they, you know, prefer natural areas. They're preferring their parks. and They're trying to avoid humans. Just kind of common sense stuff, but it actually is showing up in uh, some of these other studies. And um, the males, being that they're a little bit, um, well, how do I put it? They can get away with a lot because they're young, dumb, and don't have to raise young. So they're more willing to encompass some of these areas that have perhaps lower habitat quality. They're more willing to encompass areas that are highly fragmented. And highly fragmented is, ding, near the, the definition of an urban landscape. And actually, a lot of these studies have observed a similar or higher survival rate in an urban area versus rural. Anybody got a hunch as to why that is? Food, maybe. But so both are going to have food, but why higher survival? They're protected from the guy that wants to shoot them when they see them. Yeah, so they're not going to be uh, harvested or, or shot for depredation purposes, for agricultural purposes. So a lot of times in the city, you don't see people running a trap line or you know, going out doing predator calls in their backyard in their gated community. <laughs> um, also, some, some research has suggested that they've shifted more of their activities from crepuscular to nocturnal. Um, you think about it, where, when is our rush hour? At crepuscular activity level at times. So if you're going to try to avoid humans as much as possible, maybe shift towards more nighttime activities. Not to mention there's so much light pollution. Um, if your factor is, you know, you need more light to hunt or your prey need more light to forage, um, you could actually be a little bit more active at night. Diet quite similar, especially um, here, since we still have tons of rats, mice, and squirrels and rabbits. Uh, in many cases, we have far more of those critters in an urban area versus a rural area, especially squirrels. And again, very low conflict with humans and pets. But the major question is, are things that we learn in Arizona or Southern California or North Carolina, are those relevant to urban bobcats and urban carnivores here in Texas? So with that outstanding question, a collaborative urban bobcat study was initiated with a number of players to answer some of our simple questions. You know, the th same thing that some third grader is going to ask me. Where are they? What do they eat? Third grader might also ask me what's their favorite color. But <laughs> we're going to try to answer a lot of these simple questions. You know, um, at what density do they occur? What type of corridors are they using? What type of habitats are they using? What type of uh, you know, abundance are, is there? And can we use some of folks like yourself to try to report some of this information? Um, so a trail camera study was started uh, last fall with a graduate student at TCU. That's wrapping up in December. She's going to be hopefully defending her thesis this next spring. She was doing that to try and see if she can essentially design a program to deploy cameras to try to get, you know, to document these animals and, and identify behavior when they're going to be active or not. <clears throat> and then we also have a graduate student from Utah State University that she's down here for the, for the calendar year, and she started trapping bobcats, fitting them with GPS collars, and that began just this last January. Um, so the TCU camera study, um, she has two urban, again, relative, two urban study areas. Uh, one is in Lake Worth, which is, you know, less urban, and she has another study area in east central Tarrant County, right along the Trinity River here, um, that's a little bit more urban. 
And so she has 30 cameras deployed, 15 in each site, and um, she's had over 300 bobcat observations on these trail cameras. And to um, show you what that means, <clears throat> to be statistically um, rigorous, she has a very clear set of restrictions that she has to follow when deploying these cameras. She's not going to the best place she can find to put up a camera. She's told, okay, here's a square acre or here's a square mile. You have to put a camera somewhere in this area. So she oftentimes has her hands tied, but so for her to still be able to land at least three, over 300 observations of bobcats, that's pretty impressive. But she's also getting a lot of other photos that are pretty insightful. Here's a photograph. There's wild turkey in the background and feral hogs in the foreground. Um, she, she's kind of using some of the techniques that were used by a previous TCU student that was setting up trail cameras in all the Fort Worth City parks to try to document uh, feral dogs and try to get some information on those critters. So again, um, there's a lot of information that's going to come years down the road still from the information that she's collecting on those cameras. <clears throat> But um, the other study that the Utah State University grad student, her work, which is much more fun to talk about, uh, what I'll probably spend most of the day on, is um, she set out to capture and collar bobcats, also in eastern Tarrant County. Um, you probably recognize most of these major road roadways. Here's DFW. Um, there's a terrible football team that plays here. <laughs> Um, I can't say terrible, they're actually winning now. I should say terrible baseball team that plays right there. Um, kind of a good chunk of an area. Um, this area was selected because there were a lot of uh, observations. We knew a few landowners, and we figured we could get access to this area to try to trap these cats. But also, it's centered right on the Trinity River. Um, it does have a lot of bottomland hardwood space. Ideally, you'd be having animals occurring there. Um, <clears throat> goodness gracious. So... With uh, her efforts to capture, she was using these big box straps. Um, she captured 14 cats. We were able to collar 10 of them. We do have a rate, weight restriction. They have to be at least 12 pounds in order for us to collar that animal. Um, they're equipped with one of these GPS collars. It's very simple. It's just basically got a GPS unit, a battery in it, a radio beacon in it, and it's got a little device here on the strap that after so many weeks, that uh, device will cause the strap to separate and fall off the animal. It's not until we recover that collar and manually download the data that we get any information from that individual. Um, so it is a little frightening to know that we've got animals wandering around with all this data, and if that collar should crap out on us or that collar disappears or fails, there goes all the data. There are more expensive techniques. There, you can actually have it send you send the information to a satellite, and you get emailed it almost instantaneously. Um, you can get text messages with this data. But those are quite a bit more expensive. Um, so we wanted to try to get as many collars as we could possibly could. Um, so of the 10 animals that were collared, we had seven males, three females. Male average size is about 23 pounds. Females were 17 pounds. Um, here are all the capture locations throughout the, her study area. You can see there's some kind of in the, the bottom line area next to the Trinity. But we were also up in the Texas Star Golf Course, if you're familiar with that area in Euless. Um, she was able to capture a number of bobcats up here. This is also at an apartment <laughs> complex golf course area. Um, that's where she trapped and captured a 28-pound uh, male that's well known to the residents there. Um, the, the lady that feeds the Muscovy ducks doesn't like him so much, but <clears throat> quit feeding the Muscovy ducks. Um, so some of the work that we've seen in the rural areas has suggested, like I said before, that females have a home range of about one square mile. So just for you know, us to get a sense of how much area these critters might be occupying, these are one square mile buffers around where females were captured. Adding in where males, we saw about two square miles. Okay, this is maybe an idea of how much area will be covered by these collared animals. However, um, shortly into monitoring these animals, and I should say monitoring when... Um, and we, so we know we have to keep track of these animals, so we know where they're going to be and where to expect that collar when it drops off. So we do get a location on them once or twice a week. Oftentimes it's just we get in an area, we hear the beacon. The beacon has a live or dead signal. <coughs> we hear you're alive, okay, good to go. You know, I don't need to get your location because the collar's doing that for me. We had a couple males that moved quite a distance as the crow flies. We knew this from our ground telemetry, but we also had one bobcat showing up on a bunch of our trail cameras. TCU student put out her trail cameras, obviously, but the Utah State student also put out trail cameras to try to identify where to trap. So um, looking at those distances, 
um, males would have considerably larger home ranges than just two square miles. So, uh, you know, about seven square miles is what we were seeing. Should be male home range. Um, <coughs> seven square miles with a, you know, a diameter of basically four miles here. That's what, how much area we might be covering. So this was just us before we got really any information in hand, kind of speculating how much area might be covered by these critters. Um, so we deployed 10 collars. Um, one collar was slipped by an animal. We were able to redeploy that collar back on another cat. We also had another cat slip a collar about a month ago. Um, figure it's summertime, you know, they're, they're leaner, they're smaller, it's hot out there. And this was near a creek as well, so we figure she might have gotten a little bit wet and was able to finally work that collar off her. Um, which is unfortunate, but it does mean that we, what, we get data. We get it data in hand. Hooray! Um, we also have one dead collar, uh, and this is unfortunately just a product of this, this technology is that you can't always assume that these things are going to work the way they should. So we actually went and flew for two missing bobcats. Uh, we found one of them, um, and then another one we looked for, we never heard him. A week later, uh, he showed up on one of our trail camera photos, and because these animals have very unique spot uh, markings, we could identify him on that trail camera photo with photos that we took of him at his capture. So that's a great tool that we can use to identify individuals. Because we even do put some stuff on the collar so we can try to recognize them, but as you can tell, that's kind of difficult to see, especially in a black, blurry, black and white blurry photo. So that was cool to know that also, when we flew for him, it wasn't like we missed him. His collar is just not working. Um, but we have had two mortalities. We had one bobcat get hit by a car, uh, and we had another bobcat get hit by a train. Um, some people go, oh, that's bad. Well, it's data. <laughs> you know, we wanted to look at what is, what is the survival of bobcats in an urban area. And these things are incredibly important to know because if no bobcat dies, then we're just going to say cities are great. We should have tons of bobcats, and they can do just fine. Um, the cat that got hit by a car crossed that street or numerous, numerous times. Finally, just the odds caught up to it. Um, the male that got hit by a train, his back legs got clipped. Um, so we figure he's just not very smart. Um, but that actually is quite common. Uh, I've, I've worked on um, three or four bobcat studies now. This is my fourth state where I've studied bobcats. In almost every state I've heard of bobcats get hit by trains. Uh, in agricultural areas, it makes a little bit more sense because that's where a lot of early successional habitat is. That's where the trees are, are along train tracks because everything else is a cornfield. So they spend a lot of time near train tracks, just odds catch up to them. Um, so we have now data in hand for four and a half bobcats. Um, there is one male that was captured by animal control and so we were able to take his collar, download the data, put it right back on him. So that's why I say we come up with a half of a bobcat. So right now we're actively tracking six and the one that's got the dead collar we're actively trying to trap right now. Now we're getting some cooler weather it's definitely making it a little bit easier. We can be a little bit more aggressive because when it's hot weather out, we definitely want to make sure that we can respond immediately. And one of the cool tricks that we have with these traps are that we have a little sensor on the trap, so when the door closes, we get a text message letting us know that the door closed. Um, so we can respond as soon as we possibly can or to come to find out that there's kids screwing with it. So um, <laughs> thankfully, the grad student responds to those things. I wait for her to tell me because I'll get text messages at 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm like, I'm not getting out of bed for this. 45 minutes later, I get a text back, armadillo. Good, I go back to bed. So this is the data that we have for those four and a half bobcats. Uh, there's, this is a young male, you can see in orange. This blue that scatters all the way across here, that's a younger male. The red here is a, um, a real young female, and the yellow here is an adult female. Um, so you can see quite a bit of area is being covered. This guy obviously didn't catch the memo that this is the boundary of our study area. <laughs> <laughs> and I like to give our grad student a hard time because she helped, she really was, she was the one that identified our study area and our boundaries. And unfortunately, our eastern boundary just barely goes into Dallas County, so I can't just say Tarrant County or deal with the Tarrant County data. But I'll forgive her. Um, but we're already looking at some things. Granted, this is cer certainly anecdotal, um, but there's already some, some good observations that we're making about habitat selection, habitat use. Um, so the, just this young male right here, you can see he's kind of all over the place. Um, the Trinity River moves right through here. Um, this is the, uh, let me see, 
River Legacy is right here. Um, the Village Creek drying beds are right here. So this guy covers quite a bit of area, but if you put on the map layer of uh, FEMA floodplains, you can see how extremely well his data fits these floodplains, especially right along here, you know, right along here. This is not in the floodplain. You don't see hardly any locations of his. So that's one thing that, one of the things we were kind of speculating is that these bobcats are probably infiltrating or accessing a lot of these areas by following the creeks, by following the riparian areas, areas along waterways. Um, this young guy, you see kind of all of his dots all over the place. You can see they kind of fork up here. Um, so you might speculate that there's probably a creek up here, and that's also maybe a riparian zone that he's following. But when we look at another map layer, our land cover layer, this is kind of noisy, but you see this color that's kind of, I don't know, to different people it may look peach or beige or taupe or light cream, whatever. <coughs> Coffee creamer, I don't care what you call it. Um, that represents what we call open space or turf. Um, basically like a lot of lawns, a golf course, a ball field will show up as this. Some residential areas, if they're open enough, will kind of have that look to it. If you look at his locations, they're almost all within these open areas. And I can promise you this is all cream colored underneath these locations here. He's avoiding the heavy residential, which is the dark red. Um, he's avoiding somewhat, for the most part, a lot of these, uh, or say, developers of the red, residential and the blue. So it looks like some of these areas are really where he's wanting to go. That's an important feature to him. Also, something that we're really getting at is, as far as home range size and composition is that look at all the right angles in these two animals' home ranges. Um, in our highly fragmented landscape, you're going to have animals that are going to have oftentimes some very sharp angles in their home ranges. Typically, you, know, you think of an animal home range, you just think of like some blob, some amoeba looking thing. Um, or if it's something following a stream, it's probably going to be long and linear along a stream. These guys, they're definitely dependent upon, I mean, their home range is dictated by that fragmented landscape. Um, so this means a lot when it comes to identifying home ranges. It also means a lot when it comes to identifying corridors. How are they moving? You can see this animal is moving along this thing. I think there's a fence line right there. This is just a thin strip of trees. Um, this is a thin strip of trees. So there's a lot of things that we're going to be able to pull out of this data to identify what these critters are doing in the Metroplex. And then so we've got another need. So we've got all this GPS data. We'll use that GPS data to create habitat models. And then we can apply that to the landscape and create habitat maps. However, we need to know, are those maps worth a darn? Um, you know, simply if a habitat model and habitat map says that, you know, this parking lot right out here is great bobcat habitat, how do we validate that? How do we verify that? Well, typically the, the best answer is using some sort of independent data source, using something to help validate those suggestions and those predictions. Um, and so that's what we're after right now, is we need to try to identify where these things are being observed in the Metroplex, so that way we can try to validate our, our maps and models. Um, so one great way to figure that out is, hey, you know what? Everybody's seeing these things. You go onto Facebook, you go to any nature's website, Nature Center website, there's tons of photographs of bobcats. There's stories about them. They're making the news about popping out of sewers. Um, these things are everywhere. If you ask everybody to report every little brown snake, you're not going to get anybody to report. But bobcats, a lot of people are excited about this. We've got s roughly 7 million people here in the Metroplex. If just a tiny percentage of those people reported the bobcat sightings that they saw, that can go quite a long ways. So because we have that data need, um, we went after um, creating a project on the website called iNaturalist. How many of you have heard of iNaturalist? Oh, good. Um, how many of you have not heard of iNaturalist but have heard of eBird? Ooh, good deal. So iNaturalist is a free website, or is a website and a free mobile app that allows you to record any observation of plant or animal in the entire world. It is a great resource for all of you. Most of my master naturalists that I've talked with and worked with love it because if you see something and you don't know what it is, you take a photograph of it with your cell phone or your point-and-shoot camera, you put it on iNaturalist, you can put a little button that says ID help, 
and somebody is going to be giving you an answer, oftentimes within a day or two. And oftentimes it's by some expert, whether it's a hobby expert like one of you in here or it's one of our professional experts. Um, so we created a project on iNaturalist called DFW Carnivores. On this project, um, you can add any observation that falls within the taxonomic order carnivora. Do, um, does that allow you to submit an observation of a possum? No, not a carnivore, marsupial. It does allow you to put feral cat, though. It does allow you to do skunk, raccoon, fox. Um, and it has to be anywhere within the, the 10 central metroplex counties. Um, I created this project in August 2013, so just a little over a year ago. We've got over 400, and we're pushing, I think, 420 observations of carnivores throughout the metroplex. Um, I need to update some of these numbers, but as of February, we had 80 bobcat sightings. 93% of those had a photo. Um, now we're up to almost 140 bobcat observations throughout the Metroplex. And those could be repeats of the same individual, um, but it still matters because it's still an observation of an animal somewhere in the Metroplex. Um, back in February, we had observations in 29 different cities. Um, Leela's gotten a lot of photos. How many of you know Chris Jackson spends a lot of time at Leela or runs the DFW Urban Wildlife website? Um, he goes out there. I introduced him to iNaturalist, and now that is his main repository. If you want to see what Chris has been seeing, go to iNaturalist. He you can go see his observations on iNaturalist. He reports everything um, to my project, and he has his own project out there as well. Here's River Legacy, uh, where a lot of bobcats are observed. Unfortunately, there's been a lot of feeding going on, but I think they're now getting that fixed. Um, my office is down here in Cedar Hill. A lot of these are me. <laughs> um, but there's a lot missing from these parts. Um, and please do me a favor and continue to spread the information. This is information I want. Uh, if you've got a photo, even if it's three years ago, or even if you don't have a photo and you know what you saw, that's still, I still want that. That's still valuable information. Um, one of the fun things about iNaturalist is that Parks and Wildlife has numerous projects on iNaturalist. On iNaturalist. We have a project called the Herps of Texas. I think that's somewhere like 11, 12,000 observations have been added there. Um, it's curated by our herpetologists, the herpetologists at UT and the herpetologists at Texas A&M. If you take a picture of a lizard or a snake and you put it on that project, you are going to get an answer from the state expert. Um, so it's a great resource for you. I'm learning a ton from it. I'm like, oh, purple flower, I don't know what it is, don't care. Now I'm like, ooh, purple flower, I don't know what it is, but somebody will tell me. It's a lot, I can spend a, you know, I do enjoy going to my field guide and trying to figure these things out, but sometimes some of those plates, you know, they're drawn by somebody in New Jersey, and they just don't really look like what I'm seeing here. iNaturalist, um, you know, gives you help, oftentimes it's local help, but you can also look at what other people are seeing in this area. You can query any area. So if you want to go, I want to see all the snakes observed in Denton County, you can do that in iNaturalist. It'll show you a map where everything's been observed and have photos to accompany that. So if you want to say, what's an example, a local photo of a Texas horned lizard, you can actually look at that and see how they look here versus how they look in Kansas or Nebraska. So this project, um, I thought I was going to get just a lot of first-hand visuals, but you'd be surprised how many people are using trail cameras in urban areas. Everybody's getting those, slapping them on their back fence posts. You know, they've got a creek or a power line right away. People are putting these things up everywhere, whether they're just paranoid or just having fun. <laughs> We're getting a lot of observations on trail cameras. And another great thing about iNaturalist is if you're not really great or comfortable with identifying tracks or scat, Add that to iNaturalist. There are people out there that are professional trackers that go on there. They have their own project as well. Um, they can tell you what it is, so you kind of get off the hook a little bit. You don't have to feel that you have to be the expert on raccoon tracks to be able to share or to identify that track. Somebody's going to give you feedback. Um, and we've had a number of carcasses reported, um, a handful of scat. You know, even if, it's, even if you take a picture and you think it's bobcat, turns out to be coyote, that's still valuable because we're still collecting that information. We also have a project on iNaturalist that's called the Mammals of Texas. It is managed and curated by our state mammologist. So even if you see a photo of a bobcat but it's not in one of those 10 counties, it can still be shared to that Mammals of Texas project. And iNaturalist is all about sharing information with everybody. So... 
Um, for example, if I saw a road-killed skunk out here, I could take a photo of it and I could add it to my project, DFW Carnivores. I could also add it to the Mammals of Texas project. There's also a project called the Skunks of Texas that I think is a PhD student that's doing skunk research, is soliciting skunk sightings. Um, but there's also a project out there called, um, I think it's called ASC Roadkill Observations. They want roadkill sightings of anything, anywhere in the world. And so a lot of us researchers, a lot of our scientists, this is just giving us monstrous piles of data and information. We have folks in Austin that it is their job to keep up with species accounts statewide. You know, they're the people that draw those maps and say, oh yes, this animal has been seen in this county. Those maps are being completely redrawn due to the influx of information from my naturalist. We've got a lot of critters out there that there's maybe only been 20 sightings in the history of recording things in the state of Texas. We're now up to 40 or 50. It's crazy what this is happening, and it's all because the public's getting involved with this stuff. Many, how many of you are herpers? No, oh, we got one hand. Well, the herpers are pretty nuts about going out to places, going to places you normally wouldn't visit, and getting really excited about this. They're reporting tons of stuff out there. If you have a passion, um, whether it's hummingbirds or wildflowers or your native grasses, observations on iNaturalist are vetted by your peers. So uh, if I post a photo of what I think is a hognose skunk, I can have anybody in the entire world agree with me or disagree with me and suggest something else. Um, so if you really love dragonflies or robber flies, you can just go on to iNaturalist and help people with their observations of those critters or plants. So if you've got some little niche or some little fun you know, skill that you want to share, iNaturalist is a great place for you to help out. So some other surprise sightings that we've gotten, we've had five river otter sightings uh, reported to the DFW Carnivores Project on iNaturalist. Um, we kind of knew river otter were here, but we didn't know where and in any abundance. Uh, I know that Leela has a lot of otter sightings. Um, I was talking with a guy at um, State Park up here, and he said that he's got a couple sightings. So I'm trying to get people to, you know, add this information, give me this information. But we've also had four mink show up in the Metroplex. Who knew we had mink in the Metroplex? Yeah. So how many people are seeing these things that Parks and Wildlife have no idea are here or no occur in any abundance? So all it takes is just one observation to, to kind of rewrite the book in many ways. So that's what we're trying to get the public involved with this stuff because there's only just a handful of us to try to cover large areas. But if we've got just another handful of really passionate, educated, informed folks like yourself here, we can go quite a long ways. Um, so just giving you kind of a, a heads up of where we're headed next with this bobcat study. Um, all the trail cameras, for the most part, are going to be retrieved here in the next couple months. The TCU student will be wrapping up all of her work. The Utah State graduate student, she might have trail cameras out just long enough to try and uh, figure out where to try to trap with that dead collar. She doesn't know quite where that animal goes, so she's able to deploy cameras and say, okay, this guy keeps coming here a lot. Here's where I'm going to set up my, my, my trail or my trap. Um, these collars will start dropping off here late winter, early spring. Um, once they drop off, they will uh, change their beacon. They'll go to a mortality function. We'll be able to know that that collar is sitting still. And we can go then recover it, download the data. If the mechanism doesn't work on some of the collars, we're going to have to go out there and try to capture that animal and manually remove the collar. Um, that's a lot of work, but that's what you got to do to get your data. And we're trying to also see how we can use volunteers. Um, the issue of trying to identify diet is kind of tricky. Now, if we can get scat, that's great, but who's really looking for scat? Who's holding on to it? Um, you know, if everybody in this room was interested in, in going and collecting scat, some of the issues that I'm facing are where can we go that we can put 60 people out there in one property and make it worth everybody's time? Um, if you're seeing these things, go ahead and send them my way or let me know. Um, I'm in the early stages of trying to see if we can't get a bridge track survey conducted with master naturalists. Um, in eastern Texas, every three or five years, their biologists go out to specific bridges, spend some time looking underneath those bridges for tracks, primarily for river otter. But they also record everything else they see. Um, I would love it if we couldn't try to do something similar in the Metroplex 
and train everybody up on at least just Bobcat, maybe River Otter track ID, and see if we can't add to our iNaturalist database our knowledge and try to see are they, partic are they using particular structures. Um, and I was even thinking about maybe holding a training at Leela because that's probably the best place to actually get otter tracks because there's a lot of them up there. And we do have some master naturalists that are helping just every once in a while with a little bit of radio telemetry work. Um, and then again, just still really pushing hard for uh, contributions to iNaturalist. I appreciate you folks. If you can you know, tell people about that, this website, the URL is a little bit long, but anybody just goes to Google anyways, so just Google iNaturalist DFW Carnivores. Um, or you can shoot me an email, and I'd be happy to send out links to anything. Um, and so I guess another little quick plug is that um, I'm going to be speaking for the Fort Worth, well, the Cross Timbers Master Naturalist Chapter monthly meeting next month. And I'm going to be talking a lot about how we utilize our citizen science information, why it's incredibly valuable, and how we can use some of this information for this study. Like I said before, it's one way to validate our models that we're creating. But we can also create habitat models just with the sightings alone. So let's say we get 100 river otter sightings. I can then use those sightings to create habitat maps for river otter here in the Metroplex. So any of these, all this information is getting put to use, and it's not just, oh, cool, they're here. Yeah, that is great. That is good to know just you know, presence, absence. But we can actually take it to the next step and actually start to create some models to help conserve these critters in an urban landscape. Um, so a number of folks have been a big help with a lot of this project, spreading word about a lot of our requests for observations. Um, a lot of folks have been great in allowing us access to their properties to be able to try and trap. Um, the nice thing is in the Metroplex, a lot of folks are pro-fuzzy thing. Um, rural areas, not so much. Or it kind of varies in, in the rural areas. Oh, that's a coyote. In urban areas, oh my goodness, it's a coyote. <laughs> Pick up the phone, coyote ran through my lawn. Is there a question? <laughs> what do I do? What do I do? Um, well, okay, well... Let's identify the issue if there is one in any at all. So um, I appreciate, again, everybody, if you could help me spread word about we want this type of information. Um, also, I saw a number of Texas Horned Lizard license plates out in the parking lot. Uh, how many of you voted for the new optional license plate? Um, how many of you... vote for the dragonfly license plate? <laughs> <laughs> um, if you didn't know, so we are adding another license plate to join the, the Texas Horn Lizard, not to replace it, just to join it as another option for funds to go to wildlife diversity for non-game research and conservation in the state of Texas. Um, so it just closed on Wednesday. There were six options, right? Six or seven options. Um, I saw the data a couple weeks ago. It was pretty interesting. I think it was the hummingbird and the rattlesnake were like tied. <laughs> but the hummingbird was an overwhelming... Uh, choice by females. The rattlesnake was an overwhelming choice by males. So it's kind of, I don't know what the numbers are, 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 the final numbers are, but a lot of the data is pretty interesting. But uh, appreciate you spreading word about that. Very simply, 97% of Parks and Wildlife's Wildlife Division's budget comes from hunting. But yet we have an estimated 4 million people that are participating in bird watching, hiking, kayaking. Uh, going out and just enjoying wildlife in the outdoors, they don't hunt and they're not really contributing towards wildlife conservation and adding to the resources that are necessary for non-game conservation in the state of Texas. Um, we do have a Facebook page. Uh, there's two urban wildlife biologists here in the Metroplex. This is our page. We keep it pretty updated about what we got going on, a lot of cool things happening in the area and some of our projects and some fun photos and, and videos that we get. Um, question S. Um, so that's, and that's not even fit in there. Uh, if you can't see that contact information, um, uh, well, get closer. But um, <laughs> I'd be happy to answer any questions at this point, uh, whether it's related to what I presented here today. Um, I'm not in a hurry to get out of here anytime soon, so if you want to stick around and ask something more personal, certainly you can. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to tell you that the Friends of Leela is offering an iNaturals workshop. And I wanted to invite everybody here. It's November the 12th at 7 p.m. at the Louisville Library Computer Lab. There are 11 people signed up, and there's only 16 uh, stations, but we will have other classes. If you want to, go ahead and email me or put your name on the back of the run thing, and I'll get in touch with you. November the 12th, 7 p.m. Yes. 
Yes, that is true. But the room may be more crowded. So email me as far as we see, okay? Yeah, that's great. And we actually... Um, so I've been trying to recruit as many people to this, and uh, there's one individual named Sean Fitzgerald. He's a professional wildlife photographer in Deep Ellum. And got him introduced to this. He actually has, he represents, he's the president-elect of the North American Nature Photography Association. They have adopted iNaturalist. So they're going to be pushing it nationally. But locally, he runs a number of meetup groups where people get together, wildlife photographers, and have excursions. They teach each other. Uh, and he's trying to get them educated on it as well. So Sean and I are actually working on having a presentation in Deep Element, his beautiful <laughs> studio, to try to introduce this to the conservation community because he's just excited about it. He's like, I spent eight hours yesterday trying to figure out what this butterfly was. You mean to tell me if I stuck this on iNaturalist, somebody's probably just going to tell me the answer like that? Yeah? <laughs> and think about it, for photographers as well, your B footage, you know, many of you probably are hobby photographers, if you don't land that National Geographic level photo, it's oftentimes it doesn't see the light of day. It has no value. You're not going to share it with anybody. But if it's sufficient enough to identify what that critter is, that has, have, has immense value to us and on iNaturalist. So now Sean's like, wow, I've got so much stuff that now has value, now has use. Um, a lot of times bobcats, they never sit still. I've got a couple photos of a, like a bobcat. The, the camera's focused on the grass in the foreground. There's a bobcat sitting in the background. I'm like, dang it, so close. That still works. That's still incredibly valuable. Um, even dead things on the side of the road, people are like, well, it's kind of cheating. It's not running off. But it's still <laughs> documenting that it's there, and it also you know, helps us validate what it is you saw. You can definitely have a photo with that and say, indeed, it is what you observed. Yes? So her question was, what is that white chalkiness um, with the coyote scat? It's powdered sugar. Um, pick it up, lick it. It's, it's delicious. Um, no, I don't, it's not powdered sugar. Don't do that. Uh, I don't know. Does anybody have any suggestions, any, any theory as to what that uh, might be on the outside of it? It seems like the bobcat scat turns that way after a while, too. Is it weathering somehow? I don't know. It, I don't know. Maybe it could also be something in the mucus that comes out. The funny thing is to get DNA from scat, you have to get that moist lining around the scat. The scat itself doesn't have much DNA of that animal that laid it. So when, when getting DNA from some critter, if you find some dried up turd like, here, DNA, uh, nope. Um, really, the, the cells that are on the outside of the scat, that's where we get the DNA from, scouring the, the GI tract. Um, so I'd imagine that, because when, when you see a fresh scat, you don't see that whiteness when it dries out. So I wouldn't be surprised that it's something that has to do with the mucus later that's around the scat when it's deposited. deposited. Man, I'm hungry now. <laughs> Any other questions, folks? Well, again, thank you guys very much for being uh, engaging and answering some of the questions that I've asked to you. I appreciate you uh, not being too shy here today. So thank you very much. We want to present you with this. Maybe this butterfly looks like the one you were after. <laughs> this was done by one of our master naturalists, Marilyn Blanton. And we hope you need a little decoration for your office. Leanne? Yeah, actually, that would be greatly appreciated. If anybody's been to Cedar Hill State Park, um, my office was a bathroom. They put walls around it, so every once in a while, one pipe starts to stick out of the floor, depending on if the, the foundation's raising or lowering at that time. So this would go great in my bathroom office. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Quite entertaining. Thank you so <laughs> Thank much, you. dear. But that is a bomb. Yeah. Bomb. Yeah. yeah. I wasn't going to correct, but yeah. Uh, Some kind of master naturalist. I talk about the village idiot here. <laughs> he was testing everyone. <laughs> All right, what about it? Do I hear a motion to adjourn this meeting? Motion to adjourn. Second. Y'all get out of here. Thank you very much. Thank you for helping us.